My name is Martin Matter with the Witness to War Foundation. It's September 19th, 2021, and we are in Warwick, Rhode Island. I'm sitting with Mr. Carl Fleischman, who serves in Vietnam in the United States Marine Corps. How are you doing today, Carl? Very good, sir. Yourself? Doing terrific. Good. Thank you for joining me. My first question is, where are you from originally? Originally from, uh, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and was raised in Connecticut. That's where I joined the service, in Connecticut. And so. tell me about your folks. What was it like growing up? Uh, boy, that's a long time ago. Mom and dad were, uh, let's see, it was my mom's first marriage, my dad's second marriage. And, uh, um, you know, we had our hard times and everything like that, but, you know, it was, it was, it was all right. I mean, I wish I could say it was roses, but it wasn't, you know, it was back in those days, you know, it was different. So, uh, uh, we all had our struggles. That's for yes, sure. Yes. I have, a, I have an older brother who was a Marine. Uh, my younger brother here and my younger sister uh, that live in Danbury area now. So, so tell me how you came to join the Marine Corps yourself. Well, I was uh, uh, in high school. I was uh, 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 I was in one of the class. I don't know which class I was, but uh, uh, I got called down to the student council meeting, uh, student counselor, to see something. I didn't know what it was, so I went down there, and my mom and dad were there. I was told that. Uh, um, my older brother uh, was wounded, and it was at back then we got along. And uh, I was mad. I ran out of the place and uh, um, went to the recruiter. I went to Newtown High School, and I went to the recruiter in Danbury, and I wanted to join the Navy because I wanted to get a, a gun that's big. I wanted to make sure I get even with those North Remies, and. Uh, uh, um, uh, the he wasn't there, Navy recruiter, but the Marine Corps recruiter was there, and uh, he said he was going to take me out to lunch. We went over to State Line uh, in New York, Brewster, New York. We we're drinking age back then was 16 years old. Well, I guess I got I had a few drinks, and, which I never drank before, and lunch. And next day I was uh, laying in bed, and I was sick and uh from the alcohol and uh, uh my mom said are you happy i said happy mom i'm really sick and because i knew i had to go back to school and she said no no sorry son you know you joined the service yesterday excuse me she said you joined the service she said you joined the marines and i was really shocked and that afternoon that during yesterday the day before i was i had my physical sworn in everything to the marines and uh, um, I went ahead and uh, caught the bus that evening and uh, went down to Paris Island and my career begun. <laughs> uh, so obviously there's multiple points of training in the Marine Corps, but was there any story from your training, basic or into armor, that sticks out in your mind? Uh, no. No, it was, uh, uh, I did the best I can. Uh, it sounds funny, as big as I am now, Back then, I weighed 105 pounds when I joined the Marines. I was 105 pounds after I get left the Marines, you know, from boot camp. And then I was 105 pounds when I went to Vietnam. And when I came home, I was 110 pounds from Vietnam. So uh, I, I just could not, I mean, I was a lot of muscle, but I just couldn't gain weight for nothing. So uh, uh, now there was nothing special about, you know, school. Um, I went through all kinds of school. Uh, uh, interrogation interpreter school, 50 caliber machine school, uh, caliber school, uh, tank school. Uh, well, I went to a lot of schools before I could, you know, get going to Vietnam, which I was looking forward to it. And uh, um, that was it. You know, I, I, uh, I did the best I could. And so. Oh, yeah. And uh, tell me about when you went to Vietnam and uh, where you arrived when you got there. Okay. I, when I got to Vietnam, we, we hit a typhoon. And uh, so we could, we had to go land in the Philippines. And uh, uh, we spent the night in the Philippines. And then we got on a plane. We headed to Vietnam and we landed in Da Nang. Um, uh, nothing exciting about that. We, you know, they mustered us to various areas to uh, uh, where we were going to go. And uh, um, I picked up a convoy to Fubai, where that's my first duty station, Third Tank Channel HNS Company. So uh, uh, that's what I did, my first when I first got there. So. And tell me about some of the guys in the unit. Who do you remember being in the company? Oh my gosh, 
Well, I, I one of the, my best friends in the world. He's the godfather of my son and everything. His name was uh, Ashley Benjamin Pepper, and he was an E4, a corporal. And when the Beatles come out with the song Sergeant Heart, Sergeant. Sergeant Pepper. Sergeant Pepper, Lonely Hearts Club, uh, uh, he picked up Sergeant. And I call him Ben, and I, I you know, we, we just end up in the same tank and, and uh, uh, same tent or bunker, whatever it was, together. And we just became very, very good friends. So, which which I'm very happy about that. And I, we, to this day, we still talk, talk to him yesterday already. So we talk all the time. He's a Kansas City Chiefs fan. I, we like my wife and I like the Seahawks, and we call back and forth. Anything you do with Seattle, Washington, against Kansas, we're always talking to each other. It could be college bowl, it could be baseball, it could be anything. And uh, uh, it, it's just—he's a good friend. I enjoy him. Uh, my tank commander, after I, uh, my second Purple Heart, my tank mayor, uh, commander was uh, John Weir. So uh, him and I go back quite a few years, and uh, it's been enjoyable and, and knowing him and everything like that. And uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't trade a second of any of it. I just won't. It's just my my life is my life, and I'm proud of it every minute. So, so as I said, uh, is there a story from Vietnam that is particularly important to you that you want people to know about? Well, I was uh, after we were in Phu Bai, and uh, I got there in '67. And uh, 68, we picked up a convoy. We were going to go up to Contien, and the convoy was going to go through Way City. And everything was peaceful and quiet and everything like that and until we got to the outskirts, the southern part of Way, and, and then all hell broke loose. And we just, you know, we all didn't know what was going on. We weren't told there was going to be, you know, supposed to be 10 defense, uh, 10, uh, the holiday for the, you know, the, for the Vietnamese, and uh, there was nothing supposed to going on. Well, we started. And I, I was a driver of, of Hotel 52, a tank, and uh, um, we were just getting shot at left and right, left and right with small arms, no RPGs or anything. And uh, um, we went into way, uh, we, we got into the Mac, MACV compound, and from there we were trying to figure out what's going on because we didn't have a lot of uh, our troops there in, in the southern part yet. Or even in another part of the way, and uh, uh, we just started working our way, house to house, street to street each time, and uh, um, it, it was uh, it, it was rough. It was rough. I mean, that whole thirty days there, I don't remember one day sleeping outside the tank. We all slept inside that tank, so uh, it, it was it was interesting. And, and like I said, we. We did all kinds of crazy things there. I mean, we we, we we fought as hard as we could, but unfortunately, you know, we also did play. And uh, um, one day we uh, uh, we could see that the army was was having a ball there. They had motorcycles on the back of trucks and and things like that. And we decided we we're going to rob a bank. <laughs> Doesn't work. It's not as easy as people think it is. So. Uh, I, I remember that, and then I said, um, my second Purple Heart was in way, and uh, we did Perfume River um, and everything uh, when, when Tet was over. So uh, I was one of the ones that went into way in the beginning and went out the way. Even though I was wounded, I just couldn't get on a helicopter, they said, so, which was okay. So, uh, and then as we were leaving, um, uh, way on the perfume on a, a little landing craft uh, from the Navy. We went to, uh, let's see, uh, towards the ocean uh, uh, that way, and then uh, they said that we were going to jump on some land there, and there was nothing. There was no barbed wire, nothing. So we started to um, lay the barbed wire, do the you know uh, perimeter and stuff like that. Um, and Ben Pepper showed up. You know, he, we, we got to somehow connect, and him and I were just being friends again, talking about the families and everything like that, and uh, uh, we noticed a couple of boys walking across the street, uh, across the, uh, excuse me, not street, uh, um, trail, and uh, they were carrying something, and I 
caught a little glimpse of it, and when I turned around, the boys were going the other way with nothing on his arm. And the truck driver, uh, we were on a, a deuce and a half. Um, he, uh, uh, he was driving, and I told Ben to jump. We had to jump for it, because I knew we were going to hit a mine. And I cleared the, uh, the vehicle. I was in midair when we hit the mine, and Ben was still in the back of the truck. I was thrown down and hit against the uh, back of a pagoda. And uh, um, I, when I was laying there, I looked up in the air, and all I saw was Ben going up. And then he came down, and uh, we were inside the minefield that the kids uh, put out for us. And uh, um, everybody kept yelling, you know, it's a minefield, don't go in, it's a minefield, don't go in. But uh, like I said, Ben was a good friend. And so I went inside the inside, I guess, the minefield and uh, made sure he was all right and helped carry him to the helicopter when he called it. Um, and, and I told him I'd take care of his stuff. He said, please do. And um, time we got back to the, the tent where his stuff was, it was a free for all. People, you know, looking for dry socks, underwear, whatever they get their hands on. They they left the personal stuff, but it was the clothing that meant a lot to, to you know, to people. And uh, um, that was the last time I saw Ben for a few years. It was a few years. We we continued up north. We picked up the uh, landing craft again. We ended up uh, coming in from the Perfume River on the ocean side, uh, north side of the Perfume, and. Uh, um, we went ahead and uh, worked our way up to Contien, and that was, you know, pretty much a way city. That I mean, I was, like I said, that was a big one. That was uh, a real big thing that happened for us. So, uh, first, I want to ask about robbing a bank. What, what did you mean by that? What, what happened there? Well, you, you can't go to a bank and knock on the door and they're going to open it for you. And uh, we. Uh, uh, <laughs> We we took a couple of hand grenades and with some tape and taped it to the to the vault door and uh, pulled the pins and ran like hell and uh, like I said it's not as easy as people think it is they didn't do anything to the bank the doors they were very thick <laughs> so uh, um, it, it's uh, it was interesting like I said we just always as kids I mean we were adults young adults in the Marine Corps but we were kids. We were old kids, and uh, it just didn't work. <laughs> so we gave up. But we did get a refrigerator, <laughs> one of those small ones. In so, Vietnam, that's valuable. Yes, it is. That was very valuable. I was surprised, you know. And uh, money's nothing, I guess. Back then, it wasn't. You know, we, we didn't know anything about it. So, uh, but we got a refrigerator. I'll never forget that thing. We put it on the back of the tank, and once we landed in the uh, Contien, there was more holes in that thing. <laughs> So we we got a new uh, refrigerator, but we lost it. So <laughs> refrigeration back then, I bet it still worked. Bullet holes. I bet off. you would. Yes, yeah, probably did. But we we just gave up one. So, uh, uh, but then then I like I said I I finished out my tour of. Well, uh, oh, well, I'm I did sorry. want to ask about Way City. Yes, sir. If you could tell me some more about what happened there, what you remember about. The well, I remember uh, we were by the Mac V compound, and we were receiving. Uh, uh, rounds hitting our, you know, the Mac V pounds. And we, we located where it was coming from. It was coming up uh, by the uh, bridge in uh, uh, Way City over the uh, Perfume River. And uh, uh, we were asked, uh, uh, Hotel 52 was a, a uh, 90 uh, tank. It wasn't a flamethrower, it was a you know, gun tank. And uh, they were asked that their, the weapon was underneath the bridge. Could we get around in the bridge? And uh, we took our gunner, I was, I was again in the driver's cell and I, we aimed it towards, you know, the tank towards it and then they f finalized it with the, uh, uh, with the gun and we laid one perfect underneath the bridge. The bridge wasn't affected, but we knocked out the gun. So that, that, that was a big thing. We were very, you know, pretty good proud and everything. And then while we were in the, uh, uh, by the back of the compound, Walt, Walter Cronkite was interviewing people and, uh, uh, down the street was there was people running from this point to point B across the street, and we everybody was up there trying to shoot this poor person, and it was back and forth back, and uh, uh, we we finally took the uh, the fifty and the thirty and just laid a track of bullets towards them, 
and uh, um, we finally hit it. And I found out that with, with the person we hit, which made us really feel bad, they were civilians carrying ammunition and rounds and stuff for the, the Viet Cong. And then when we found out that what we killed, well, geez, they, they didn't need, deserve to die. They didn't do anything. But uh, at the time, you don't know these things. I mean, it had to be a, I don't know, a quarter mile, half a mile down the road. So you just, but Walter Cronkite interviewed us and uh, uh, it was pretty cool to be interviewed by him. And uh, then it was back to business, back to business. And then we uh, um, we went down the street one morning uh, with our tank, and uh, um, we uh, um, were going. I was the t uh, driver again, and the tank command was Robert Hall, and then our two loader and gunner. And um, as we were going down the street, I was noticing people being shot, and uh, um, I noticed this one person. Um, he was kneeling, and next thing, the rifle went down, and he had a big smile on his head, and he got creased in his head. He wasn't shot in the head, but he just had a crease in his head. And uh, it's like, gee, we gotta do something for him. So uh, uh, Hall said, drop the head. Uh, underneath the driver is the escape hatch. And uh, we opened it, dropped the hatch, and worked our way over to the guy, and got him underneath, and we pulled him in, and uh, uh, we, we uh, got him away, and then we went back to get the hatch. And after we did all that, we started moving up forward and everything like that, and I noticed one of the, the uh, lenses that the driver could have, I saw this gentleman, uh, uh, step out, had an RPG, and I yelled RPG, and I turned the tank, and uh, he hit us, and it was just enough to, it, it, it was penetrated into the tank, but it wasn't a direct hole. It, unfortunately, it hit Robert Hall in the face. And uh, um, it, it, was, it, was, it was, that was a tough one. That was a tough one. And uh, we were, you know, we knew we were hit, the place was smoking and everything like that. And uh, I put the tank in reverse and not knowing what's behind you or anything like that. And uh, we got out of there. And once we were clear of the action down the street a little bit, I got out of the tank and uh, uh, we, we, uh, we got hauled out of the, the cube. And uh, there was, uh, it was a mess inside there, but he w we got him out and uh, um, uh, I carried him to a mule. And, and uh, the, the driver was drove and I was in the back with, with Hall and Hall had me here and here with his fist. And uh, we got to the MACV turn a compound. A corpsman and a doctor came out and uh, um, they just told me to just hold him until it's over because there was nothing they could do for him. It was that bad. So uh, I held on to him and uh, uh, it, it, um, he passed finally, so and it, it's a different experience when you when you uh, uh, that happens to somebody, and uh, w when that happened, like I said, it it bothered me for to this day it bothers me. I mean, and I uh, um, I, I still think of Robert Hall a lot. His name is on the wall. And uh, nine, uh, 2000, no, 1999, excuse me, 1999, when we went to the first time went to the wall, I got to see him. And uh, that was a lot. And then I got to uh, uh, always thinking of him, stuff like that. And then I, uh, I finally bought a new truck in 2004, I think it was. And... Um, I wanted to do something, but I didn't know what I was going to do. So, anyway, my son and my wife took the tailgate for my uh, uh, um, truck, and they had it sent out, and they did a mural on the back. Well, let me tell you, that mural has brought uh, a lot of things, and uh, um, uh, it meant a lot to me. To have him there that was my you know my memorial to him and and 
I had so many things happen with that truck with his name on there and everything like that. So, tell me about coming home from Vietnam. What was it like getting back to the world? Oh well, I, I when it was time to come back to the world, I refused to come back to the world. I uh, uh, extended six months back in Vietnam, wanted to stay, and uh, um, when I did that, I volunteered to be a grunt because I was six foot tall, 105 pounds, and so I became a tunnel rat for a while. And uh, um, it, it, it was different. It was most definitely uh, different than the uh, uh, with a tank, but they, they needed somebody to do it, and I, would, I just fit the billet at the time. So that's what I did. You might have been the tallest tunnel rat in the history of Vietnam. Yes, yes, I, but it was you, 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 your legs stuck out while your head's inside, so it was enough to where they enjoyed it, you know, not enjoyed it, apologize, wrong word. Uh, they, they trusted it, okay, we know what to do, and everything like that. I said, okay. So, but then when it was, time to come home, um, which I did. I had my third Purple Heart then, and uh, um, uh, I flew into California, and then I had a flight from California to Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, um, uh, <clears throat> I landed in Hartford, and no idea, my parents didn't know I was coming home or anything yet, and uh, um, I uh, um, couldn't figure out how I was going to get from Hartford, Connecticut to Newtown, Connecticut. And uh, I didn't have that much, you know, a lot of money. I didn't know, nobody knew I was coming, so I wasn't expecting anybody to wait for me because I wasn't sure when I was going to be there. And uh, uh, I went out to the thing, and uh, uh, a uh, gentleman from a cab company stopped and says, uh, uh, one of those I lost. I said, no, no, I, I told him, you know, my predicament of being here and my parents in Newtown, Connecticut. And uh, um, I asked, you know, how much for, uh, uh, you know, for a cab ride? He said, come on, I'll give you the ride, we'll do it. So it's okay. So uh, we jumped in the cab and we drove to Newtown, actually Sandy Hook, Connecticut. And on my way to my mom and dad, I ran into my, my, I saw my younger brother walking in the road. And we pulled over and we picked him up and you know, tears were there and everything like that. But uh, uh, we went to see mom and dad then and uh, uh, and cousins and aunts and whatever else showed up and everything. And uh, uh, that's what I did when I got home, so. Uh, so we have some newspapers. Uh, so. Yeah, tell me what you have. I have this. This is called the Northwest Navigator, and it's a Navy uh, covering all the bases in Kitsap County. And uh, um, this was my truck, and uh, uh, and, and my son had an RC car. And he had a, a identical uh, uh, copy of the of my truck. And what the, what this is is this is the uh, the, the uh, Vietnam War Memorial. This was a POW flag. This is Hotel Five Two tank. This is the Iwo Jima monument. This was a, a picture of the uh, 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 Vietnam. And this little brown spot here was the uh, a highlight of Robert Hall's name. And this was not a decal, this was hand painted. So it, it meant a lot to me. And like I said, my son made it on the truck and everything. So this is the one paper, like I said. And then this one is where the animal gets, uh, got involved. And there's a whole article about it. And it's, this is right by the animal's uh, um, uh, headquarters. Oh, excuse me, and uh, uh, um, he just, he's never seen anything like it. So uh, he did his thing, uh, helping to, you know, to awareness and the, uh, uh, whether it is to have a friend that deep. And uh, um, so I have that, I sold it, I, it was on my truck. It was a 2004 Dodge Ram three quarter ton truck. And it was a Mac, I mean, I, that, between the mural and the truck was beautiful. I, and then there was 
my son and I were in the, uh, I don't know, two years ago, I don't know what she went through, about four or five years ago, um, I couldn't get in the truck anymore. I just can't, couldn't, couldn't get in it. So I asked my son if he wanted to be, he said, no, dad. I said, okay, because he didn't like Dodge. And uh, so uh, um, we were in a restaurant, guy heard, I was talking about the vehicle, he, ha he says, how much you want, uh, how much you want for it? And I didn't want to sell it, but I, I, you know, I talked about it. So I threw out a price, the guy said, I'll take it, because he knew it was the truck. And uh, I said, you have the truck, but you're not getting a tailgate. So I, um, I have that tailgate home still. It's there, and I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet. I haven't figured it out. I mean, if it's, if it's uh, fits in a casket, I guess I'll take it with me. But if not, oh well, then my family would know what to do with it. <laughs> so um, that was pretty much it. Like I said, coming home was... I think the best thing that, that happened to me on the way home was running to my younger brother. It meant that much. It was a surprise. So, so my final question is: Do you have any words of advice for any future generations who might be watching your interview? Well, I don't know. I'm not a smart man, I guess. Or your life is your life. Cher treasure it every moment. I mean, if you do something wrong, correct it down the line, but don't be embarrassed about it because it's your life. And that's mine is my life. I'm 72, three, something like that. And I would never change a minute of it. I've been married to my wife for 52 years, 53 years. So it, it means that much. It really does. And I, it's an honor to know all of my, my friends here at the reunion. Uh, it's an honor to have my family there. And I respect every military person out there army navy air force marines coast guard salvation army i don't care you're there you're our future please take care of us well carl i can't thank you enough for taking the time to come share your stories with me it's an honor and a pleasure but more importantly thank you so much for your service we greatly yes, appreciate sir. you're welcome sir thank you